Welcome to my beginner tutorial course on Python in 2024. If you've never written a line of Python or you've been on long hiatus, this is the course for you to watch. I don't want you to be left behind, so let's start now. Okay, so before we actually begin coding, we need to have Python downloaded and some piece of software that we can actually code in, which is called an IDE. Well, the first thing is let's download Python. So if you go to python.org downloads, which will have all these links in the description below, you'll see a download Python button in the middle. So let's go ahead and click that. And this downloaded a .pkg file for me on a Mac. So I double click it and then we have the installer. So just go ahead and go through all of the installation steps. Now, the next thing we need is an IDE. That stands for Integration Development Environment, which is basically a piece of software that allows us to write other software. And a couple of the popular ones are PyCharm and Visual Studio Code. You can use whatever you would like, but I use PyCharm, so I'm gonna show you how to download that. Now, once you go to the link that I have in the description, you'll see PyCharm Professional. Don't download this one. This is the paid version, right? This is, it only gives you a free 30-day trial. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see the PyCharm Community Edition, which is the free version, which is what I use. So go ahead and download this. And on Mac, you can simply drag and drop this to applications or on Windows, you can just go ahead and have it install and go through the process. Now, whenever you run PyCharm for the first time, you'll have to go through some settings, but just go ahead and skip all them. And then you'll be directed to a screen where it would show projects if you had them, but for your first time, you won't have any projects. So you'll look for a new project button, click that. And then on the next screen, we just need to give it a name. So we can say Python beginners course. All right, give it some name and then everything else you don't need to worry about. We'll just go ahead and click create. Now we officially have our first project created and we do need to create our first file. So we're gonna right click beginners Python course project go to new and then go down to Python file. Then we just give it a name like main and then it'll create the Python file for us right here. And this is where we're gonna write all of our code in this tutorial. Now we are ready for developing and let's get right into coding with our first line and type print, hello, Tyler. Now what this will do when we run our file is print onto our terminal, hello, Tyler. Let's go ahead and do that now. And in PyCharm at the top right of the screen, there is a green run button. It'll say run main.py. So go ahead and click that. Now what it's done is it created a terminal called main and it printed hello Tyler onto the terminal. Well, good job. You just created your first line of Python code. Now the next thing I wanna cover are variables. These are very important and we use them all the time from now on. Variables can hold information like numbers or text that we can use later. For example, instead of saying print hello Tyler, we can first create a variable and we do that by giving it a meaningful name like name is equal to Tyler. Since we have now stored Tyler as a variable, we can use it wherever we want to. We can now have a printout like this. We can say print hello comma, then the quotation marks and then say plus name. Or you could also come in here and say comma name, whichever you prefer. I'm going to say plus name. And if we run this again by clicking the run button, it now prints out hello, Tyler. And it says Tyler because we stored that as a variable. We didn't have to come in here and explicitly have the string Tyler. Now, this was a brief example of how to store something into a variable that we can use later. But what else can we do besides printing them onto the console? Well, this is where operations can come into play. They allow us to manipulate data in our variables, whether it's performing calculations, comparing values, or combining strings. Well, let's go ahead and do a couple operations right now. I'm gonna say addition is equal to 10 plus five, multiply is equal to 10 times five. And then when we print this out, it should give us 15 and 50 respectively. And it does. So we just perform some basic math operations. Let's create a couple more variables and combine the strings. So I can say first underscore name is equal to John. And then last underscore name is equal to Doe. Now we can combine these with another variable called full underscore name is equal to first name plus, and then we want a space here. So we can give this quotes and then plus last name. And what this is gonna do is combine these strings together. And then we can go ahead and print out now the full name variable. So if we run this, this should print out John Doe and it does. Okay, great. But there is another important operation that you will need to know, and that is called a Boolean. This means something is either true or false. Here's an example. 
Let's go ahead and create a couple more variables that are different. Let's say a equals 10 and b equals 5. So I went ahead and created two print statements here. This symbol that looks like the right arrow is saying a greater than b. So this is going to either return true or false whether or not a is greater than b. And in this case, 10 is greater than 5. So this should return true. The next one says, is a equal to b? Well, I have a with the double equal sign b. So this saying is a the same value as b. And well, as this case, it is not. So this should return true. Let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. It gives us true and false like we expected. This is important to understand, and this is leading us into the next topic called control flow. Control flow allows us to make decisions in our code and execute different actions depending on the conditions. We can use something called if statements by using Booleans to help guide the flow of our program. Let's go through an example. Let's create another variable called is sunny is equal to true. Well, now we can go ahead and create our first if else statement. So if is sunny is equals to true, and then we have this colon here, so we can go to the next line. But as you can see, if depending on the editor you're using, I have this yellow squiggly line, and it says I can replace the Boolean expression with is sunny, which basically means in order, you don't have to say equals true. You can just say if is sunny, and this knows it means is this true. So if is sunny is true, then we can print out it's a sunny sunny day. Otherwise, we say else, meaning if that's not true, whatever is sunny, whatever that is, if it's not true, do this next thing. We can then print out it's not a sunny day. So let's go ahead and run this. And it does. It prints out it's a sunny day, which means if I also go ahead and set this to false, it should print out it's not a sunny day and it does. I just want to say you're doing great so far. And before we go to the next topic for loops in the control flow structure, I want to talk about lists. So far, we've been dealing with variables that hold a single value, whether it be a name or an age. Well, what if we have a bunch of names or a bunch of ages that we have to do something with? Well, we don't have a bunch of variables holding each of those values. Instead, we can have one variable holding a bunch of values, which is called a list. So for instance, for a list of fruits, we'll say fruits equals, then you give it the square bracket and we can give an apple comma, banana comma, and then cherry. So now we have three strings, which are fruits in the fruits list. Then we also have a list of numbers also denoted by the square brackets. This lets Python know that you're creating a list of something, but you can have a mixed list. So here in this mixed list, we have a string, an integer, a floating number, and then also a Boolean value. Now, there are a few things about lists that you really should know how to do. And one of them is how to access any of these values by using what's called an index. So let's take the fruits example and just try to print out apple. Let's go ahead and erase the others. And if I just say first print fruits, this is going to print out all of the fruits in the list. So apple, banana, and cherry. But what if I only wanted apple? Well, I could say print fruits, the square brackets, and zero. Now, apple is the first item in this list of three, apple, banana, and cherry. But apple is also in what's called the zero index. Whenever we look at the actual places or positions in this list, we always start at zero. So apple is actually at zero index. So if we say fruits, square brackets of zero, this is going to retrieve the first item in this list. So if we run this, it prints out apple. Now, what do you think if I want to print out cherry, what would I have to put here instead of zero? Well, if you said two, let's try this and you would be correct. That prints out cherry. And this is how you can access a specific item in any list. Now, just be careful. If I were to say three and try to run this, you get a list index out of range. This means that the list doesn't have an index within the range from zero, one, and two. We try to access three, but that doesn't exist. Now, sometimes we wanna modify items in a list. So here's how we do that. First off, let's go ahead and print the original list. And then let's say we wanna change banana to blueberry. How do you think we would do that? Well, we would say fruits of one, which is the position for banana, is gonna be equal to blueberry. Then let's go ahead and print out fruits again. And let's see the difference. So go ahead and run this. Okay, the first time it's apple, banana, cherry. Then we modified 
the position where banana is in to blueberry, and now we print out apple, blueberry, cherry. Now, one more operation about list that I want to show you is inserting another fruit into this list. So let's first just start out with an example. Okay, let's go ahead and erase this block of code. And I'm gonna say fruits dot. Now, this is a little different. Before we were talking about a single item in the fruits list. So I would say fruits of zero, then do something with that, right? But this time we're talking about the whole list. So I'm just gonna say fruits, then say dot, and you can see it comes up with what our methods of this list that we can perform or execute. And the one I wanna talk about is insert. For insert, we need to give it the index or the position in the list we want to actually insert this new fruit, and the object is just the name of the fruit. So let's say we wanna insert a kiwi between apple and banana. So I would need to give it one as the position and then the name of the fruit, which is kiwi. Well, let's just go ahead and run this and see what it does. Let's also print out fruits after we do this. So let's run this. And now we have apple, kiwi, banana, and cherry. So apple is at index zero. So we want to insert kiwi at index one. So after apple, we have kiwi now, and this pushes banana and cherry over to the right, a new index. So banana is now index two, and cherry is now index three. We can now go back to the for loops topic. Now let you understand lists a little bit better. Let's say we have a list of temperatures here. This is a list of integers, and we want to determine whether each one is above or below freezing, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Instead of checking each temperature individually, we can use a for loop to go through each item in this list and then make the comparison for each value. Let me show you what I mean. Now I'm gonna type this code out first and then explain it. So we can say for temp in temperatures, and then now I can have an if else statement. So if something is below 32 degrees, it's freezing. Otherwise it's not freezing. So if the temp is greater than 32, print the current temperature is above freezing. Else the current temperature is at or below freezing. Now let's unravel what just happened here. Okay, first off we have the list, so temperatures, right? So we say for temp in temperatures. So in temperatures, we're saying in this list, and then for each temperature in that list, let's check something about it. So we're gonna assign each value in this temperatures list to the variable temp. So the first time through, the first item in the list is 28. So the first time we go through the list, temp is gonna be equal to 28. So we're gonna say if, 28 is greater than 32, which it's not. This then means this is false, which means we go to the else, which is, has to be true. Then print the temperature at 28 degrees is at or below freezing. And then once 28 is done, it moves on to the next item in the list, does the if else check, then to the next item and so forth until it's all the way through the list. This may make a little more sense if we run this. So let's go ahead and do that now. Run your main.py file. And now we can see each temperature's printout. So if I scroll this down just a little bit more, it says 28 degrees, as I said, that was false for this if statement. This was not true. So it came down to the else and printed that out. The next one was 35 degrees. If temp, or which is 35 degrees, is greater than 32, then print 35 degrees Fahrenheit is above freezing. And this is powerful because instead of saying if temperature of position zero is greater than 32 or not, if temperature at position one is greater than 32 or not, and so forth, that's a lot of code that you have to write, or we can have this for loop that goes over all of the temperatures in this list, and then we can perform an if else statement on them. The last topic before our project I wanna go over is user input. So far, the data in our variables has been hard coded, meaning we defined it directly in our code. But what if we want to create a variable with a value based on input from a user? Well, this is where user input comes into play. And I've already started the code here as you've been looking at. So I say, I want the variable name equal to the input. Now this is a built-in Python function. So what this is gonna do when we run this is it's gonna ask us to enter a name. And then when we do, this variable name is gonna be equal to whatever we put here. And then I can say print hello give it the name with the exclamation point. So let's go ahead and run this now. So it's gonna say, enter your name. It can't do anything else until I do this. So I'm gonna say Tyler, 
and then it prints out hello tyler now this is just a simple example but let's go over one more real quick to show you something now going from the previous example with temperatures we can have a temp equal to the input from me or you and then have the if else check to see if the temperature is above or below 32 degrees well let's go ahead and run this now so run this i'm going to enter the temperature 33 which should be true oh but wait I get an error. It says the type error greater than cannot be supported between string and integer. What does that mean? Well, what this is saying is whenever we enter this input for the temperature, this is always going to be a string. So we're trying to basically say is 33 the string greater than the integer 32. And it does not know how to compare strings and integers. So how can we fix this? Well, there's something called casting. And what that basically means is we can tell Python to convert this string into an int. So let's go ahead and do that now. So let's go ahead and minimize this, convert this back to temp. And actually right here, we can say int and then uh, parentheses. So have temp inside this int parentheses. And what this is doing is going to convert this temp, which is a string of 33 into an integer. So if we go ahead and run this now, let's put back in 33. And it says 33 degrees is above freezing because we now are comparing an integer with another integer. And this is important for the project. Okay, you're doing wonderful. We just went over some of the basic concepts of Python and we did a little bit of coding. You're doing great. Now for the next part, I have a project for you and I'm gonna explain in the editor how I want you to do it and what I want from you. But go ahead and pause the video, try it for yourself and then replay and then I'll show you how I did it. Okay, for the project I want you to try on your own is the simple temperature converter. The first thing is we need to get user input from the temperature they are converting from if they're either using C or F for Celsius or Fahrenheit. And then we need to also get the user input from the current temperature. Then we need to perform conversion either C to F or F to C. Then we print out that conversion. And then I've also given you the conversions from Celsius to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to Celsius. And then as a bonus, try this. Also, we need to also check for any errors. Maybe somebody will accidentally give you another letter or not give you what you're actually expecting. Now, I want you to try this on your own. Pause the video, like I said. Pause the video, see what you can do. If you finish this, wonderful. Or if not, at least try and then resume and I'll show you how I did this. If you have any comments or questions or any other topics that you would like to understand, leave them down in the comments section below. And now that you've completed the beginner Python course that I've created, here are a couple other courses about AI that you should know. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next video.